Good morning or good day to all. Welcome to Cardiovascular Innovations 2020. Uh, my name is Manish Parikh and I'll be the chair of this uh, morning session. Uh, I wanna congratulate um, the organizers of the Cardiovascular Innovations Program, uh, Drs. Banerjee, Berlakis, uh, Shishabur, uh, and Sarajya. And also I wanna thank Boston Scientific for this opening symposium. We've got a very, very exciting 60 minutes ahead of us. Uh, I've got a, an absolute uh, all-star panel, and we're going to be talking about something that's really near and dear to me and many of you as uh, interventional cardiologists, complex coronary disease, specifically honing down this morning on, on diffuse lung disease and its treatment. Um, without further ado, uh, let me introduce our, our panel. Uh, we're going to lead off with... Uh, Somebody who needs no introduction, a good friend, Simon Walsh from Belfast, uh, North Ireland, who's going to really uh, give us a, an overview of a, of a case and do a deep dive on, on what's upcoming with respect to treatment for these long diffuse diseases. Uh, we've got Kathleen Kearney from University of Washington. Kathleen is going to bring us home with respect to vessel prep, which is such an important critical part of our complex coronary treatment strategies. And of course, our friend Matul Patel from the University of San Diego is going to talk a little bit about imaging and complex coronary disease. Of course, my favorite part, which is towards the end, where all four of us are going to have 20 minutes along with you, our audience, to discuss not only the cases, but uh, large aspects of what we do in the complex coronary arena. Uh, these are very special and difficult times uh, globally. Of course, as a New Yorker, we just uh, uh, went through something I've never gone through and hopefully never have to again. Um, uh, all of our thoughts and prayers are out there for all the colleagues on the front line. Um, the country is really going through a challenging time, but I think it's these types of sessions that bring us all back to who we are as physicians, taking care of patients. So without further ado, Let's kick this off. We've got a terrific case that Simon Walsh has provided, uh, and let's start that case off. So thank you for the opportunity to speak at the uh, digital version of Cardiovascular Innovations in 2020, and thanks to the chairman for the introduction. My name is Simon Walsh. I'm a cardiologist from Belfast in Northern Ireland. I've been asked to talk to you about uh, the use of 48 millimeter stents in contemporary practice and to reflect a little bit on the Evolve 48 study. Uh, just to put this into context, we've had long stents available in Europe for some time and they're commonly used and our practice has moved on in treating normal to normal rather than spot stenting. So we're not anymore looking for sort of the worst bit of plaque and putting a stent in. We're trying to treat the artery from normal to normal. The Evolve 48 study has uh, completed enrollment and one year follow up um, and the results of this will be pending at TCT in 2020. We did contribute a lot of patients to this study and uh, were uh, amongst the leading enrollers in it but I'll not steal the thunder of that presentation to come. Uh, in terms of where these stents are useful, uh, I have a case presentation for you. Uh, basically, this involves a patient who presented uh, initially with some ventricular arrhythmia uh, and ACS with chest pain um, in the COVID-19 pandemic early on. Uh, he's very poor ventricular function, a very high BMI. Uh, he's a type 2 diabetic with a reduced uh, uh, renal function, EGFR in the 30s, and basically has multivessel disease with left main equivalent and a dominant left coronary, uh, which led to a heart team meeting. Just to reflect on his images, his right coronary artery is recessive. He has uh, a significant disease in the left circumflex, and I think if we look at this critically, we see that there's quite an extensive atheroma, maybe some healthy tissue in between, uh, but quite a lot of uh, trouble there. And then if we look at the LED, there's certainly osteal plaque, which was also evident in the caudal pictures, uh, but very lengthy segments of atheroma from the proximal vessel right down to the mid vessel, and probably extending out to the distal LED as well. Uh, at the heart team meeting, the considerations were that he had a Turtle 2 syntax score. Uh, we weren't certain about viability, certainly the atrioapical area looked to be uh, 
partly infected at least with quite marked hypokinesia. Um, and we were worried about limited availability of uh, anesthesia, ICU beds and cardiac surgery. So ultimately we felt it was reasonable to proceed to PCI for this patient. So I'll now hand this across to the panel and we'll uh, uh, discuss what the strategy should be to take the case forwards. All right, Simon, thank you for that terrific case. Um, let's talk a little bit about how you manage a case like this. Clearly, uh, we see this all the time with the high burden of diabetes, renal insufficiency, and diffuse disease. Um, Kathleen, looking at this type of case, what are the things that you worry about? And what are the types of strategies you think about with respect to treatment? Yeah, thanks for um, the intro and the great case, Simon. I think uh, as he nicely outlined, I guess we're worried about long-term durability anytime you're looking at multiple stents and long segments of disease that are going in. Um, sometimes there's the area of interest, but then as you start to come up with the PCI plan, you start to see that yourself stenting, you know, longer segments of disease and um, just making sure that we've got good prep um, and a good idea of how we're going to tackle that. And then of course, just always thinking about efficiency, you know, this gentleman is on the larger side, so you've got some radiation concerns potentially, um, as well as contrast maybe, and just trying to minimize ischemic burden so you can get it all done in one shot, ideally. Matul, these types of patients we're seeing more and more of, uh, lots of comorbidities, uh, challenging anatomy, not always the best surgical candidates, even though, yes, this gentleman is diabetic, uh, ventricular dysfunction. What's your algorithm when, when, when you jump into these cases? How do you manage them? Uh, at, at your place? Are these ad hoc cases? Uh, what's the heart team approach look like? Where do you take this? Yeah, no, thank you. Those are, those are great questions. I think, um, you know, in a patient like this that, that is diabetic, as you mentioned, with multivessel disease, um, we don't typically do these ad hoc unless there's some extenuating circumstances. And currently what's going on in the world, uh, this may be a case that you do uh, somewhat ad hoc to get the patient out of the hospital. But in uh, typical circumstances, <clears throat> excuse me, this is a patient that we, we do get surgical input on. Um, and ultimately it comes down to that, to a heart team uh, decision as well as uh, input from the patient and the, and the referring provider. Um, but yeah, I, ideally what you want, as uh, Kate mentioned, you wanna get uh, an outcome that doesn't lead to uh, issues with the patient coming back to the lab. So, um, you know, you want uh, I ideal uh, vessel prep, uh, image guided and FFR guided uh, intervention for these patients, similar to uh, syntax two type of uh, algorithm. Great, Simon. So the, the Euro exp European experience for these types of patients, I mean, you're seeing, we're seeing more and more of these. Um, how are you managing these types of patients in the lab? Are, 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 are you comfortable jumping right in at ad hoc or are there lengthy discussions uh, or surgeons that come in to discuss these types of cases? Yeah, it, I mean, I think we still always try to do what's best for the patient. So it's um, important where it's appropriate to consider surgical approaches. Uh, this particular gentleman wasn't uh, ideal for surgery, even though his syntax two scores actually strongly favored it. Um, and then you throw in the COVID uh, sort of pandemic on top of things, which complicates it. But where it's appropriate, we'll always step back, have heart team meetings. We've actually gone to a team's meeting every day now um, for inpatients, which has been a, it's been a good step forward. Actually, it increases the efficiency and it stops the patients having to hang around for, for decision making. So it um, has moved our, our uh, process forwards a little bit. Great. So we're going to jump right into uh, our first uh, case-based lecture from Dr. Kathleen Kearney, who's going to talk about vessel prep. Let's just go right to that. Thank you. Uh, good morning. I'm Kate Kearney from University of Washington. I'm going to be talking about the importance of vessel preparation and diffuse disease. Here are my disclosures. So, of course, uh, initially we'll get some talks today about evaluating diffuse disease, but I hope to briefly convince you that image guidance and invasive physiology are our friends with this type of patient population. Also to emphasize why adequate vessel preparation is so important to reduce risk factors for target lesion failure and diffuse disease and develop a plan for adequate vessel prep in these lesions. So why is vessel prep especially important in diffuse disease? Well, 
course, we know that there's a number of patient factors that put them at risk for recurrent events, um, but those also overlay with PCI and technical risk factors for instant restenosis, which are modifiable by us during the procedure. We know that any underachievement in our luminal area gain has additive resistance uh, built up over as we increase the length of the treated area. In addition to that, that can be worsened by ambiguous landing zones and any, any untreated inflow or outflow disease that we didn't feel to identify. Uh, all those things are important, of course. In addition to that, we're just more likely to be dealing with side branch disease and a higher degree of plaque burden or diffuse nature of the disease, uh, which can emphasize the importance of vessel prep to both reduce plaque shift and may uh, affect our treatment strategy or pre-treating those side branches to avoid a two-stunt strategy in some cases. Um, so we know that stent length and calcification predict target lesion failure. This has been seen in a few different registries. Uh, here's one data set from Zettoli and others in a recent look from last year where they found that total stent length was actually the only predictor at 30 days, whereas we had others including moderate to severe calcification, the post-procedural diameter uh, looking 30 days to a year with reference vessel diameter being the, predict the technical factor um, observed at five years of uh, TLF. This overlays, of course, with clinical factors like smoking and diabetes and other patient-relevant issues um, that overlay with high plaque burden and diffuse calcific disease, which then have implications and have been shown to see higher rates of higher degree of complexity in terms of the PCI that's required, uh, both with bifurcation disease and CTOs, those patients then have a lower rates of complete rebask. If we want Syntax 2 style outcomes, however, we have to do the work that they put in. So up front, they were using new generation drug eluting stents. In this case, that was the biopolymer degradable Everlumis eluting uh, synergy drug eluting stent. But Importantly, they also did physiology-based revask. They used image guidance to optimize uh, their stent results and used contemporary CTO techniques to improve their success rate. On the background of guideline-directed medical therapy and very low LDL, we saw a vast improvement in both MACE and VP revascularization. Um, but if we want to achieve those results, we have to do the work that they put in as well. This all starts with evaluating diffuse disease. I think uh, the more we learn, the more we know angiography is insufficient. So to help us decide what to treat in basic physiology, and particularly with pullback in these long segments of disease can really help us identify the target. Um, in many of those segments, it visually may not appear very significant, but that long calcified lesion might be more physiologically relevant to the patient than something that's juicy and easy to pick off in 10 minutes and get out of the lab. Once we've decided we're treating, uh, really intravascular imaging is necessary to help guide a lot of the decision making. Sometimes this is with atherectomy, and, uh, but with always it's other vessel preparation needs in terms of sizing for our balloons and our stents, where to land them and to verify our stent integrity in the end. And I would argue that vessel preparation is the product really of our imaging and physiologic assessment. And stenting is just the icing on top to make it look pretty at the end. But the bulk of the work we do in gating improvement in the physiology of the patient um, comes from this other investments that we do up front. Um, here's just a case of a woman who's come back a number of times for, piece, uh, excuse me, for angiogram due to angina. We've seen this uh, occluded RCA repeatedly. I've also, we've also so repeatedly assessed this circ lesion because I think that looks relatively easy to treat. I actually repeated the IFR because I didn't believe how normal it was, but again, it's one. So by dropping a stent there, we make ourselves feel better. We don't do anything for her. Um, she's now coming back for our CACTOPC after discussing that further. So um, we know that intravascular imaging helps us determine our vessel prep needs once we get in there. Sometimes that's decision-making with regards to atherectomy or some algorithms to help with that. We're gonna have a good talk uh, related to a lot of imaging concerns. Um, sometimes this also helps us guide what type of atherectomy we might use, um, many times in overlapping fashion. I uh, would just argue that in diffuse disease and tight leading edges, uh, rotational atherectomy is really uh, expedient and helps us get through that um, in a more efficient fashion for the patient and hopefully reduce the ischemic burden as well. In this case, uh, this is a 72-year-old gentleman with class three angina. He can't go elk hunting, which bothers him significantly. Um, not really pertinent to the case we end up going retrograde. Uh, once we're externalized though, um, we flip out for a rota floppy wire because I know that this proximal disease is going to need uh, that leading edge atherectomy. We're gonna use a small burr because there's a short segment where we're subintimal. But if you call our setup shot, really the rest of it, we don't know what decision making needs to happen or what further vessel preparation is required. So IVAS helped us identify exactly where the stent ended, where I could be more aggressive in particular, helps me see where it might be subintimal, so I'm a little bit less aggressive free dilation. Um, and we, at low pressure with the 401C, see that we've got good expansion 
number of areas. So when we finally drop our three overlapping four millimeter scents, there's no surprise that they look fine on angiography and we know that they're in a good landing zone. Um, so with angio and with our IVIS, and we're confident that we have a good scent result uh, for the patient and hopefully a good long-term outcome. I think uh, these strategies are nicely outlined by Demari and others from last year in a review, looking at dealing with high calcium content um, lesions and diffuse disease. What we gain from better vessel preparation, I would argue, is that we can eliminate gross stent under expansion. There should be no surprises, and there's really no reason for patients to have acute instant thrombosis as a result of us having stent un un uh, unexpanded stent. Um, we can improve our long-term outcomes in terms of acquisition and decreasing plaque shift and branch compromise. And we can improve our efficiency because we're anticipating issues rather than reacting to them. And in doing so, hopefully we can at least reduce unnecessary complications. Of course, complications are part of our job, but by decreasing our guesswork and doing the treatments that are needed, we can hopefully contain those and using good technique can minimize complications for our patients as much as possible. So in summary, physiology-based image-guided PCI is known to improve outcomes, and I would argue that it also improves our efficiency, especially with good practice to help us decide what's necessary for vessel preparation rather than helping us get away with what we can get in today but not necessarily having a good result for the patient, um, and sometimes really leading to a struggle in terms of getting a good result even that day in the lab. Finally, vessel preparation and stent optimization are particularly important in long segments of disease because of risk factors for stent failure. And it's really incumbent upon us, particularly in these cases, to uh, gain as much normal area as possible, get the patient a good result. With that, thank you very much. and look forward to hearing the rest of the presentation. All right, well, welcome back, Kathleen. That was really terrific. Uh, um, really nice case-based overview of, of vessel prep We'll be going to do a little bit of a deeper dive at the end of this, uh, but uh, I really thank you for that. Let's segue right into uh, our next presentation. Uh, Dr. Batul Patel from UC San Diego is going to talk about uh, imaging guided complex PCI and what it means. Batul, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Mitul Patel, and I'm from UC San Diego, here today to talk to you about uh, IVIS optimization for long lesion stenting. I want to thank the conference organizers uh, for the invitation, as well as Boston Scientific for the sponsorship of this session. I want to start with a quick case of a 64-year-old male with diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, who presented to an outside hospital with a non-ST elevation myocardial infarction and ultimately um, developed cardiogenic shock, uh, suffering from a VT arrest and successfully resuscitated. He had a percutaneous LVAD placed at that institution and was transferred to our center for either high-risk PCI or surgical revascularization. He had an injection fraction of 20%. Unfortunately, the patient developed limb ischemia and hemolysis necessitating removal of his percutaneous LVAD and transition to an intraortic balloon pump. Here's an angiogram of his uh, left coronary anatomy. His uh, right coronary artery is a chronic total occlusion. I'll save you the uh, pictures of that. So obviously the challenges for this patient's anatomy are many. Um, it's a long lesion certainly and very calcified. And we know from prior studies that long lesions suffer from uh, percutaneous uh, limitations in terms of stent fracture due to vessel rigidity risk of restenosis, uh, delayed vessel healing, the risk of very late stent thrombosis. Overlapping stents um, have certain limitations as well, which I'll get into su in subsequent slides. Um, longer lesions um, are more prone to side branch loss or side branch jailing just, to the, uh, just uh, due to the nature of the lesions. And uh, obviously there are challenges with stent deliver deliverability in longer lesions. Some of the adverse outcomes with uh, overlapping stents uh, are, are well described, and I'll go through some of these um, descriptions in the subsequent slides. But you can see an example here of a long DES, or sorry, excuse me, two uh, long DESs uh, overlapped in a mid right coronary artery with the uh, stent overlap zone on 24 month follow up, uh, showing significant restenosis. And this is shown in, in multiple uh, data sets where long lesions when treated with overlapping stents as shown in the figure below um, are more prone to uh, to target lesion revascularization these uh, 
these lesions tend to form restenosis in the overlap segment, as shown in two studies here uh, with uh, drug-eluting stents. You can see that uh, when these patients return for either surveillance or clinically indicated uh, angiograms, uh, whether uh, everolimus eluting or serolimus eluting stents and scaffolds, you can see that the majority of those patients suffer from restenosis in the overlap zone as shown in both of these charts. Again, uh, here's a graphical uh, illustration of, uh, of what I said previously. The majority of these patients when they return um, with long lesion uh, PCI, the majority of their restenotic lesions occur in the overlap zone. And we know that there are flow dynamic changes as well as increased fibrin deposition that occurs when you have to overlap uh, stents. And thus, uh, it, uh, you know, in, in terms of treatment of these long lesions, it would be nice to be able to avoid implanting stents. The FDA recently approved uh, the Synergy XD platform in the United States. And as you saw in Dr. Uh, Walsh's uh, case illustration, uh, our European uh, colleagues and OUS colleagues have, uh, have had the privilege of uh, using this long uh, platform and have had uh, great success with this platform. You can see the sizes uh, that will be available in the uh, Synergy XD in the U.S. Um, essentially, everything from a 2.5 to a 4.0 will be available in the 48 millimeter length, which will... Um, complement our armamentarium nicely here. I want to get into a bit of IVIS guidance and, and outcomes. Uh, we all know that um, the improvement in IVIS technology has led to very impressive uh, uh, resolution advantages in the most recent platform with the OptiCross uh, high-def imaging catheter, which provides a 60 megahertz uh, of resolution. You can see the comparison between the previously uh, available technology and the most current uh, technology with the OptiCross. It's really a difference between um, looking at a standard definition television and now our, our high resolution 4K televisions, uh, which provide great, uh, great resolution and the ability to really discern um, our uh, pre and post uh, PCI optimization. We also know that IVIS guided PCI has had uh, pretty significant improvements or provides, excuse me, pr very significant improvements in terms of our clinical outcome. Uh, this is a meta-analysis showing that no matter what endpoints you look at, overall MACE, cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction, target lesion revascularization, all are improved with uh, intravascular ultrasound imaging. For those uh, unfamiliar with the Syntax 2 trial, this was a trial comparing outcomes for high-risk PCI in patients with three-vessel coronary artery disease, um, comparing those outcomes using both uh, hemodynamic assessment prior to PCI as well as intravascular ultrasound uh, uh, optimization in the vast majority of patients, uh, comparing it to the subset of patients from Syntax-1 trial that were treated both percutaneously as well as with surgical revascularization. Uh, here's the schematic of the uh, of the trial, which I don't have time here to get into. But if you look, um, all patient, or sorry, all lesions were assessed uh, with IFR and FFR when indicated, and subsequently treated with the Synergy DES. Um, as I mentioned, the bulk of, uh, sorry, the vast majority of lesions were optimized with uh, intravascular ultrasound, 85%. And if you look on the right, that's in comparison with only 4.8% of patients in Syntax One whose lesions were optimized or assessed with intravascular imaging. And the outcomes were significantly um, in favor of, uh, of this strategy, looking at Syntax 2 outcomes with percutaneous revascularization, hemodynamic assessment, and intravascular ultrasound imaging compared to Syntax 1 uh, matched cohort. You can see the outcomes at one year of MACE at 10.6% versus 17.4% primarily driven by myocardial infarction, uh, repeat revascularization, as well as arc-defined uh, stent thrombosis. Again, comparing the outcomes in Syntax 2 uh, percutaneous revascularization with the surgical outcomes in Syntax 1, you can see also, uh, while uh, also a, a non-inferior 
uh, comparison between the two uh, revascularization strategies. Again, likely driven by improvements in lesion selection by hemodynamic assessment, as well as stent, uh, sorry, PCI optimization with intravascular ultrasound. Out to three years, you see the, the difference persists in terms of syntax one versus syntax two outcomes. IVIS-XPL was another trial. This was a, a, a trial of 20 centers in Korea looking at long, uh, long-term long outcomes with long lesion subsets and DES implantation, 1,400 patients, all with uh, stents greater than or longer than 28 millimeters in length, looking at IVIS and angiographically guided uh, stent implantation uh, with primary outcome being our standard MACE outcomes. And again, here you see both at um, excuse me, at, at one year, the uh, improvements um, and benefits of IVIS-guided PCI in terms of our MACE outcomes versus angi angiographically guided PCI outcomes. This difference persists at five years, um, looking at IVIS versus angiographically uh, guided outcomes um, in terms of the primary endpoint, essentially cutting that primary endpoint in half. Uh, more recently, the uh, IRIS DES uh, uh, registry also out of Korea uh, looked at patients treated with complex coronary anatomy, including left main, bifurcations, long lesions greater than 30 millimeters, and calcified lesions, again, showing an improvement in outcomes, a statistically significant improvement in outcomes with IVIS guidance versus angiographically guided uh, revascularization. So back to our case, uh, this is again, uh, is our man with the long prox to uh, mid LAD lesion extending back into the left main, you can see this is obviously going to require, uh, with our current armamentarium, uh, overlapping uh, drug-eluting stents, as well as uh, rotational atherectomy, as shown here. So we perform rotational atherectomy with a 1.5 Burr, followed by 1.75 Burr, followed by testing with a non-compliant balloon to assess um, and assure uh, expansion. Hi, good morning everyone. My name is Matul Patel and I'm from UC San Diego here today to talk to you. And then after DES implantation, uh, or sorry, before DES implantation, here's our IVIS run. You can see fairly uh, concentric calcification um, and uh, high plaque burden, especially as this run gets back into the left main, which I will just uh, fast forward to right here showing the left main plaque burden. Hi, good morning everyone. My name is Matul Patel and I'm from UC San Diego here today to talk to you about uh, IVIS optimization for long lesion stenting. I wanna thank the conference organizers uh, for the invitation as well as Boston Scientific for the sponsorship of this session. I wanna start with a quick case of a 64 year old male with diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, so after a 3.5 by 28 millimeter ES was implanted here and a 4.0 by 20 EES was implanted uh, extending from the proximal LAD to the left main with further uh, IVIS guided optimization and ultimately uh, post dilatation with both 4.0 and 5.0 NC balloons. Here's our final IVIS run. You can see a nice uh, stent expansion despite a fairly heavily calcified uh, lesion with excellent stent uh, apposition. Coming back across the left main now. Again, excellent stent expansion throughout and no evidence of proximal stent edge dissection. With this being our final angiogram. So in summary, intravascular imaging is grossly underutilized. I think about 16% of PCIs in the United States are done with uh, IVIS or OCT optimization, but this really should be com a compulsory component of PCI. Optimal outcomes in both complex and non-complex PCI are best attained with intravascular imaging. And uh, uh, it should be noted that uh, if you can avoid stent overlap, uh, you should avoid stent overlap and perhaps a synergy uh, XD will, will uh, allow us to avoid uh, more stent overlaps with these long complex lesions. Thank you very much. All right, Matul, that was fabulous. What a case. And really, I think 
highlights some of what we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis with these complex patients and lung diffuse disease. Um, so without further ado, we're, we're, we're right on time here. Uh, I'm anxious to see what, Simon, you did for this case that we talked about to, to kick off the session. Uh, it's, it's a really challenging case, uh, not great surgical options. Um, so let's go right to that and let's look at how you tackle this case. Okay, so let's move forward with the case presentation then. Um, there are a number of key factors that we need to consider for this particular procedure. So uh, the patient's large, he's got poor kidneys, we're trying to reduce both contrast and radiation. I think it's clear from the angiogram that the left main doesn't look severely diseased, but there is left main equivalent with ostea of the circumflex and LID both involved. So I think we're thinking ahead uh, with left main bifurcation in mind. Um, I think we're looking at very long segments as well. And I think in order to try and help us uh, to pick healthy landing zones and treat normal to normal, and also make sure that we do the right thing, we need to use adjunctive imaging in this case to understand what we're trying to achieve. I'll just let the baseline angiogram play and remind everybody of the proximal circumflex disease, the critical lesion in the first marginal, and also the extensive plaque in the LED, which does involve the ostium. So the first thing we did basically was an ibis of the circumflex. This is before any predilation. And what we're able to do there is to demarcate a distal landing zone uh, where there's healthy tissue in the marginal vessel. We know from that, looking at the size of the distal vessel, uh, that there's a 3 to 3.5 millimeter segment there. So we can pick our stent diameter accordingly. What we start to do, pull back, what you can do uh, is if you leave your uh, fluoroscopy in the same view, you can actually get a roadmap just by storing fluoro and putting that up on the screen. So when we see the atheroma begin, if we store that image there, we know we need to stent beyond that point. As we do the pullback, we can see the severe disease in the distal left circumflex. There's fairly critical atheroma in the top left panel at 17 millimeters from the beginning of the pullback, but actually extensive plaque with some eccentric calcification right back up to the bifurcation with the AV circumflex as well. Moving on to the more proximal vessel and where the area of sort of more healthy looking tissue is, in fact, there's not any segment there that is disease free. As we pull back from the bottom right panel up to the top right and then subsequently bottom left and top left, we can see that there's plaque all the way through that entire segment right back to the ostium of the left circumflex. And that's a 73 millimeter segment of IVUS pullback. So we need to have long stents here to be sure that we treat this accordingly. Um, so here again, we have osteal disease with eccentric calcification and those segments relate to those areas. In the left main stem, it's actually of interest that the plaque, as you would expect with a uh, true um, left main equivalent, does extend back into the distal left main stem. And you can see a bit of eccentric calcification at the distal left main, uh, which is approaching 270 degrees in terms of its arc, and further plaque right back to the ostium itself. The proximal references in the circumflex are approximately four millimeters, and the left main itself is around about five millimeters, trying to pick healthy areas. So what have we learned at this stage? Basically, we've spent no uh, contrast and almost no radiation apart from some fluoro stores. We've shown that the circumflex uh, has a healthy landing zone in the first marginal, but it's 75 millimeters away from the osteal segment. We know the distal stent diameter should be 3.5 millimeters. We know the left main is diseased, and we know the osteal of, uh, osteal of the LED is also diseased. So, I mean, we're going to end up with bifurcation left main stenting as suspected. And when we do that, we know that the pot balloon for the left main should be 5 millimeters, and that the stents that we choose should come up to 5 millimeters in terms of their overexpansion capability. So the PCI plan is now to secure the distal left circumflex. Once that's achieved, is basically to move on and then treat the LED back to the main stem, and then finally complete the culottes into the left circumflex from the left main with kissing inflation in the usual fashion. One thing that I would encourage is a more one-to-one -one sized pre-dilation uh, in this era where we have lots of options for calcium modification. Uh, here we've uh, basically pre-dilated uh, the circumflex and then deployed a long 3.5 millimeter 48 
um, uh, drug looting stent to cover that long segment there. That's optimized to 3.5 distally and then 4 approximately and we do a quick distal edge check before we switch our attention to the LED. And what we can see here quite clearly is a small linear dissection at the outflow of the distal edge of the stent. So basically that requires coverage with a short 3016 uh, saluting stent and subsequent to that uh, we now have no outflow issues and we can sw safely switch our focus and our attention to the LED. Once again this needs to be an IVIS guided and IVIS optimized procedure. So the next step here is basically to um, Take, take the IVIS and what we see is a distal landing zone of around about 2.5 millimeters. There are segments with low burns of atheroma, but none of it was truly normal. Uh, looking at this segment here, that's where we're thinking about landing the distal edge of our stent. And again, you can see the length of the segment of disease right back to the osteum on the long view here. At the bottom of the image, just at the right end of the arrow, you can see the circumflex wire appearing at the left main bifurcation. So a very long area of disease. And that's where the circumflex pertains to, and that's the distal landing zone. And we can get a length in between those. And when we look at the IVIS in more detail, uh, we can uh, basically show uh, the areas of different plaque uh, burden and where they correlate to the on the IVIS. And if you look at the top left uh, reading, we've got 90 millimeters of atheromatous plaque from the LED ostium right down to the bottom uh, where the healthier area of landing zone is. In the distal left main stem, again, just to demonstrate that there's some uh, a cons, well, almost concentric, but 270 degrees of calcium. Uh, it doesn't look the thickest or the worst in the world, but just with the two wires up here at 92 millimeters, there's a bit of calcium there. So what have we learned now? Well, basically it's the same story. There's no contrast and no radiation involved. The segment of diseases is very long, but two 48 millimeter stems will cover the entire thing and actually get us back to the left main stem. Um, there is eccentric calcification at the distal left main and the LED ostium, so we're thinking I, I think it's reasonable to go to cutting balloon preparation of that to make sure that dilates adequately. And then we know our stent diameters. Distally we should be 2.5 millimeters, um, and proximally we need to have a stent that will over expand to 5 millimeters in the left main. So basically for me in the mid and proximal LED, that's going to be a bit a 3.5 millimeter diameter stent. Once again, emphasizing that the pre-dilation should be adequate to understand if the vessel will expand when the stent is there. So it's 2.5 balloons distally and 3 O balloons more proximally. So we need to make sure that those plaque areas are all compliant and will come up to an adequate size. Next, we use a cutting balloon. This is a 3.5 millimeter Wolverine in the osteal LED and distal left main stem. And basically we're taking that up to a reasonable pressure and we want to be certain that that has expanded adequately. So a very brief cine image to show that that has expanded and that the stents will do the same. So I think we're comfortable now that we can begin to reconstruct the LED with stents and a little further uh, advancement into the mid LED with that 3.5 millimeter cutting blue. Uh, one thing to point out here is that when we're deploying these long stents, uh, there may be a perception that guide catheter extensions are always required. That's actually not the case. So here it's fairly easy to deliver a 48 millimeter stent to the mid LED. We give a little puff of contrast with the guides out, it's not helpful, but we have our IVIS roadmap from where the distal edge was. So we can basically go ahead and deploy that stent. We can then overlap that. And again, you'll notice no guide catheter extension, a little bit of resistance in the way down, but we want to ensure that we're coming back into an area in the left main that's appropriate and that we have a little bit of overlap of the stent. So we get a sense there that we're coming back to the proximal left main, we're happy, we've got overlap and we're going to deploy that stent uh, and uh, move on with the procedure. The next step is a five millimeter pot in the left main stem. And again, just make sure that that stent is adequately expanded and um, it's well opposed and that there's no risk of the guide catheter interacting with it and creating a longitudinal deformation. Subsequently, we want to rewire the left circumflex. And I think we're beginning to understand in bifurcation uh, treatment that that should be as close to the carina in terms of a distal cell crossing as possible. So I like to drag the wire from the open vessel and try and drop it into the circumflex as early as I possibly can. And remember, we've got already post-dilated stents in that mid-circumflex. 
Once we've got through uh, with the wire, it's standard bifurcation treatment. So open the struts and then we're going to uh, put a stent from the mid circumflex back to the ostium of the left main stem. We have a further pot procedure to 5 0, recross again with a coronal crossing into the LAD, and then we have two NC balloons uh, for kissing. What other steps? Well, there's numerous other steps that we don't have time to show. Uh, optimize the distal LED, mid LED, and proximal LED with NC balloons. The proximal circumflex also with NC balloons and the stent overlap in the circumflex. And then it's IVUS of everything. We want to ensure we've got adequate references. We want to ensure that there are no edge dissections. We want to make sure that the left main size is adequate and that there's no LSD as well. And here's the LED IVUS post PCI. Uh, I think with a good result, uh, we've certainly no edge dissection. Distal references are greater than 90% of the reference. The mid LED there looks good, and we've got a reasonable proximal stent area over 10 millimeters squared. Back into the left circumflex, we've got an MSA over 11 in the proximal vessel. In the distal left main, it's almost 17 millimeters squared. And at the left main ostium, we have coverage uh, for sure, with a little bit of stent touching tissue uh, from 12 o'clock round towards 7 o'clock, and the uh, top left quadrant of the stent just in the aorta. But there's no longitudinal deformation where you would see an involuted stent and double layer. So a happy result there. And these are our final angiographic uh, appearances. So I think a very satisfactory outcome, which we know is IVUS optimized and IVUS guided. And this is the cranial view of the same. So in terms of learning points, I think we want to undertake a syntax 2 type of practice and covering normal to normal with adequate stent sizing and positioning is important. I think 48mm stents have enhanced our practice. We can minimise overlaps, we can minimise the number we need, reduce cost and time, but also potentially improve later outcomes, particularly with stent fracture and later stent failure. And we need to get ourselves to think more carefully about the patient's long term rather than just an acute PCI result. It's not good enough just to walk away from a safe procedure in the lab. You need to think what's going to happen to this patient in the very long term. And this must be a durable procedure that's optimised for that purpose. Thank you for your attention. Well, Simon, that was an absolutely terrific case. So much to discuss, so much that planning that went into it. Uh, as a disclaimer, I do want to... Uh, say at the outside that uh, Simon's treatment sitting in Belfast, uh, he's able to use the European guidelines with respect to left main stenting and the 48 millimeter synergy. But having said that, Simon, I, I want to jump right into this. Uh, it's been long overdue here in the United States. We are very, very excited that at about three weeks or so, uh, the 48 millimeter synergy XD platform will be launched and available to us. Uh, we've been longing for this for quite some time. Give us a little bit about your thoughts on, on the device upgrade and, and your uh, utilization in your lab. You've had it now for roughly almost 18 months. You were the highest enroller in the uh, ID48 trial uh, that my partner, Dr. Compagliotis ran. Talk to us a little bit about that product and what we should expect. <clears throat> well, you know, it's it's exactly what you expect in terms of, of the quality of it. I think there's maybe a little per, bit of a perception around that you might need to use a lot of guide cath extension and so on, but the deliverability of it's excellent. It's pretty similar to the 38 or the 32. Like any long device, there's a little bit of a struggle in, in calcium and, and bends, but um, actually being able to deliver these long stents uh, over standard guide wires uh, is not difficult. Um, so it's... Um, it's, it just makes your life easier. The expansion profile in the matrix is excellent as well, especially in these types of circumstances where you're, you know, these long CTOs where instead of using four stents, if you can get away with three or two even, um, but the, the ability to expand this to five, seven, five, six, oh, I think it's critical. Have you, have you seen that? And, and with your imaging, have you, have you noticed any, any, any improvements there? Yeah, I mean, it's just that the, the range is, is very useful and it's very important with every bifurcation to make sure that you do understand and Kate and Matula both touched on this already. You know, you need an image guided uh, roadmap for PCI and right. I think the days of wire balloon stent uh, are long gone and what we need to do is just to focus uh, and to do this to our, the best of our capacity and when you, you understand that left mains are 5-0, you can 
bring the 3 the 3.5 platform happily up to that size. Um, and, um, you know, the, the 4.0, as you've mentioned, Manish will go up to six, basically. So it, it, it covers pretty much most of the, the left main bifurcations if we have to treat those percutaneously. Great. Uh, Kathleen, uh, you did a terrific job reviewing in a short period of time vessel prep. We've got so many different things in our armamentarium now. Obviously, we got fantastic atherectomy devices. We've got scoring, cutting balloon. We've got great non-compliant balloons. We've got, ather uh, we've got laser atherectomy or laser therapy. Break down for us how in your lab you're deciding how to do vessel prep. Sure. Thanks, Dr. Preek. Um, you know, truthfully, sometimes it's just based off what's available if someone's using it in the other room. But I'd say for the most part, um, you know, laser really doesn't handle calcium very well. And so, you know, aside from one site where that's all we've got, um, I don't think we use it nearly as often there. Where we've really relied on it historically is for instant restenosis, mm -hmm. where we see that external fibrotic or calcific disease that wasn't modified up front. And of course, we're fairly limited there. Um, so we do tend to use it a lot in those cases. I think um, the rates of no reflow, because we're often doing that with contrast, which is off label, just to try to get those bubbles and, and help with our stent expansion um, is really where that's mostly limited to. I think the other issue is just it's the only device that we can put over any wire. And so there are times where you can't get the microcatheter down. You're not able to free wire with the specialty wires for the other devices. So kind of times you're just leaning on the proximal cap there. Um, to try to make some way and get your balloons in a little further. So there are times where we're kind of using these in combination, but I'd say for the uh, bulk of the cases that we're seeing, um, really the decision is between rotational atherectomy and orbital for us. We don't yet have lithoplasty widely available, though we do have a little experience from that from the trial. Um, I'd say our center, um, just because we do a fair bit of CTO work and some other things probably realize, especially on Rota, because in terms of the subintimal space, that's the only thing that um, we use again off label, but with small burrs, you know, we have some experience with that. And I think uh, we do worry more about switching to orbital if you have a balloon uh, strategy up front and then are kind of surprised by that you weren't necessarily expecting to use atherectomy um, directly up front. Um, at least anecdotally, we're a little bit more wary of doing that. If you've already ballooned and created some dissection planes, then bringing orbital in just that mechanistically, I think you might catch those flaps a little bit more. Um, and of course, all of this just requires good technique as well. So for really long segments of disease, um, I find that it's just a little bit more expedient to stick with Rota there. And even if in cases where you might have to use two different burrs, usually planning, you know, I think um, a case like Simon's, where if you might know, well, we're going to deal with the circ, you can kind of start to modify things on your way through the left main into the circ if you're dealing with that first, and then use a larger burr going down the LED. So um, sometimes with good planning and our imaging up front, we can uh, get some idea where to go from there. Um, what's been sort of interesting when we were uh, made available with lithoplasty and some of the European experience, I think, is seeing how there's cases where using Rota just to get going and get enough purchase um, is great, but it, there's just those cases where it's very, very deep calcium and it's concentric. There might be some eccentric nodules there that even um, just with between wire bias and just the size of it, it's, a, it's really difficult to kind of maximize our vessel prep that way. And so using one of the devices up front and gaining some vessel purchase and then bringing the lithoplasty balloon in just for kind of more final optimization. Um, it's kind of an interesting strategy that I think we'll learn more from our colleagues as they gain experience with that. Yeah, and I, I think that's a great summary. I think the other thing I've been very impressed with is obviously the, the Wolverine cutting balloon yeah. um, for short segments, even with concentric calcium. You know, I even know my peripheral colleagues are using it for some of the below knee applications and, and it's really uh, much more deliverable and gets expansion where often an atherectomy may not be pulled because mm -hmm. of, of what you're seeing. So, so terrific. Mitchell, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn to you next. Uh, terrific discussion on imaging. What, what is the deal? Why is there such a barrier with the limitation of, of percentage of imaging utilization in complex coronary disease in the United States? And, and, and how do we overcome it? Because, I mean, in Simon's case, I don't see a way not to utilize imaging. I mean, it, it's, it's uh, akin to really malpractice in left main PCI. Um, 
And, and how, how do you do it in San Diego and, and what are the barriers and how have you overcome that? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Uh, you know, I think, uh, it, unfortunately, and uh, you know, I'm going to say this about a lot of uh, a lot of my colleagues out there. And unfortunately, some of it just comes down to laziness. I think, you know, if you look at what you want for your patients, what you would want for your family, I think everyone, not just on this panel, every interventionalist in the world would agree that they would image for for their family, and that's how you have to treat your patients. It doesn't add much time to the case if if you if you start doing it often. The cadence can be easily integrated into any of your algorithms. And there isn't a shred of data out there that suggests it doesn't improve your outcomes. In fact, you know, you're, you're looking at cutting down your, your target vessel or target lesion revascularization rates in half. So in, you know, if you look at any other thing we do, if you were to, there's probably no other um, adjunctive therapy that cuts you know, TLR in half. And, and so why wouldn't you do it because of an extra 30 seconds or one minute? Um, you know, you, it, it should be compulsory, to be honest with you. Um, I think most uh, of uh, us do it for left mains uh, in every case. So why not do it for every other lesion? Um, we should really be following as practitioners, uh, kind of the syntax two algorithm for how to treat all of our patients. So hemodynamic assessment up front image optimization. And, and I think it's important to say that you should image not just to optimize your stent, but you should image before to choose the right uh, stent diameter for these tapered lesions as, as Simon showed in his case. Um, and, and it's nice now that we have a long platform um, that's uh, very malleable to uh, various uh, vessel dimensions. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think Simon showed beautifully uh, how in a patient with compromise both ventricular function and renal function, that the imaging saved, you know, not only a significant amount of contrast and time, but was able to give him exactly what size product he needed in order to get the job done. And, and I, you know, it, it still uh, boggles me as to why the, the, the percentage of both physiology and imaging, but specifically imaging, uh, is still quite low in the United States and actually quite globally. And I understand. There are some financial considerations, but that's by and large uh, diminished at this point. And, and you're right. And I think the educational aspect of, of IVIS imaging as cardiologists is, is really gone by the wayside. If I could read it, anybody could read it. And you really need, need to uh, gain experience with it. So thank you for sharing that. So Simon, in this particular case, talk a little bit about um, <clears throat> bifurcation technique, especially left main. Um, what, what, you know, there are many different algorithms out there and many different techniques uh, and, and a lot of literature that's come out. Keep it simple. How, how do you do it? Um, it comes down, I think, to the daughter vessel diameters. And if they're well matched and your stent is going to overexpand to the parent vessel, mm -hmm. for me, the mechanically vastly superior option, if you look at bench testing, is culottes. Uh, and when you've seen that um, on the bench, but also in Celtic bifurcation, which we ran, you know, you've got a 7% mass rate after a at two years. And those were non-left main lesions in much smaller vessels. I think DK um, or TAP are both well suited when there's mismatch between the two. Uh, if you have major, major concern about closure of one vessel, I think DK mini crush as well as an upfront technique, uh, you may consider it. Uh, but the mechanics of culotte stenting, I think, are, are superior. Uh, and the outcomes are, are well proven, certainly in the hands of experienced operators. Uh, we'll get a lot of information from the October study, uh, which is you know almost 800 patients in it now, and you know where we recross, how we manage that, uh, Karina, and so on. I think will be um, informed substantially by that. But certainly, if I've got two well-matched vessels and a stent's going to be big enough for the left main, it's a culotte every day of the week and twice on Sunday. Yeah, no, I, I got to tell you, Simon, uh, I, I totally concur that we've sort of gotten away from culotte uh, and now are coming back to it. Uh, obviously, there's been a lot of attention for the right reasons for DK crush. But again, it's technique driven and needs really the right scenario. And I think both can be done well. Uh, and some of this data, especially the Celtic data, is actually very, very useful. So, Mitchell, back to you. I, I just want to ask you, uh, with respect to long diffuse lesions and TLR, um, 
um, what what are what are the pearls so that we don't fall into the the, the traps that that you talked about with respect to stent fracture and TLR with neointimal hyperplasia? What what are the things that that you do in your lab uh, that keeps you away from this? Yeah, no, I think it's it's kind of everything that uh, we've talked about uh, in this session. You know, um, image up front, so you have a good idea of what size stent you need. Um, but also have a good idea, as, as Kate talked about in her talk, of, of what sort of vessel preparation uh, you need to uh, perform prior to implanting the stent. So, you know, is there eccentric calcium? Is it deep calcium? You know, do you need something like a, a cutting balloon or per perhaps a, a lithoplasty for those that have that uh, available to them? Um, because, you know, the, the, the ante is pretty high for, for some of these uh, lesions that we're treating, especially some of these surgical turndowns, these sick patients with uh, multiple comorbidities, um, you know, the, the risk of stent uh, restenosis and thrombosis increases uh, with the more real estate that, that we're treating. So I think it's, it's of utmost important to image up front, to vessel prep uh, up front, and then, you know, optimize your, your stent outcome with another run of imaging. And again, as you, as you asked in your previous question, uh, there is an impediment to this uh, in many operators' minds, but you just have to get over that. You just have to image more and you'll get more comfortable with it and you'll find that your outcomes are better. Uh, your, your patients aren't coming back to the lab for repeat reintervention. And we really close that gap between PCI and uh, bypass surgery. Kathleen, I'm going to switch gears a little bit. And, uh, you know, I often get confused um, with respect to pharmacology, dual antiplatelet therapy, duration of dual antiplatelet therapy. A lot of the patients you're treating with complex coronary disease and comorbidities fall into that high bleeding risk category. Um, you know, this is where vessel prep becomes, you know, second to none because the greater the MLD, the better these patients are going to do. What types of things are you considering with respect to dual antiplatelet therapy in these complex lesions? And, and, and how does your institution handle this? Yeah, it's a great point. Um, I think a lot of our conversation with patients who are high bleeding risk ahead of time, um, we actually say that we may do things that do take some additional upfront risk during the procedure. So we're higher rates of atherectomy and stent optimization. We're gonna try to make, you know, get that MLD as as large as possible, in part because of that, because if we IVIS at the end and we feel really comfortable with that, you know, we basically, with lots of those patients, we'll let them drop aspirin, you know, very quickly. Certainly if they're on anticoagulation, we drop it basically as soon as they leave the hospital. Um, we just have them on their, you know, DOAC as well as Plavix. Um, and in patients who are just high risk from because of their comorbidities, you know, certainly after a month, we'll at least let them drop the aspirin. And after three months, we'll let them, you know, go back on um, to just aspirin monotherapy if necessary. So I think with that, you know, it's a little bit different with ACS presentations, certainly, but with our more chronic stable disease patients, um, we've had really good luck with that. And I think a you know, big piece of it is, you know, the cases we have seen of stem thrombosis, certainly the most feared issue. Um, usually there's some reason, you know, we look at the stent and there's no surprise. So it, largely we say it's incumbent upon us to do our job up front to keep them safer and able to reduce their bleeding risk long-term. Simon, what, what uh, share with us the, the European thoughts, especially, you know, some of the data, especially the SCAR registry and others with the exceptionally safe, low stem thrombosis rates with, with synergy. Um, what have you been doing in your complex non-ACS patients? Is it different uh, for this, for example, this, this particular gentleman, what will be, be your DAPT strategy? Is it different or is it the same? Well, <clears throat> just to emphasize what Kate has just said, you know, if you've done the job right at the start, mm -hmm. I'm extremely comfortable with uh, shortened DAP regimens that match the patient rather than the lesion itself. So those decisions are all patient-based. They're nothing to do with the, the stent itself or what you know mechanics of bifurcation or any of that factor at all. And if you've done an image-optimized uh, procedure, uh, we've a long history of stopping DAPT early for our patients, be they on NOAC, DOAC, or whatever bleeding risk they have. And it's not the lesion that matters provided the stents are optimized by imaging at implant. You're, you're very safe and very comfortable to, to shorten it as needed and clinically indicated. Great. 
Well, we have, believe it or not, blown through an hour uh, of, I think, just a fantastic discussion and series of, of talks. Uh, we want to again thank the Cardiovascular Innovations team and Boston Scientific for the sponsorship. We want to thank you, the audience. And although we didn't get to a lot of questions, all of our emails will be shared. Please do reach out to any of us and also your Boston Scientific representatives for any further information with respect to the launch of the 48 millimeter Synergy platform, which is about two to three weeks away. Have a very nice day. Thanks to my panel. Thank you. And we'll all be seeing you soon. Stay safe. Thanks, guys. Thank you.